uh, today the talk, the title of my talk is about the same like uh, Peter's talk as well, keys to getting your paper published. So uh, I'm very happy that uh, Peter has already delivered a very good talk about this topic. Um, I just hope that you'll find my talk complimentary to his talk and also uh, helpful for your next submission to any journal that you would like to submit to, not just nature journals or nature photonics or nature, but also uh, OSA journals, AP, um, AIP journals, APS journals, and also SPIE journals. Yeah, I hope you find my talk um, and also the advice that I give to you uh, applicable for, uh, for your submission to any other journal. Yeah. So uh, as uh, Vita said, um, I have uh, worked for the uh, Journal of Nature Photonics uh, for already eight years, eight years, nine years, nine and a half years, yeah, nine years, something like that, um, six months before the launch of the journal, and now I'm the international editor of the journal, yeah. So, um, you will see that uh, um, these are the questions that I'm trying to address. You know, I'm not so sure if you have this kind of question in your mind um, when you're writing your paper or when you're doing your research, but I hope that my talk will try to, you know, answer some of the questions uh, in this list. So, um, just like, what is good research to you and to the community? How to write a good scientific paper? What are the do's and don'ts when you do submitting your paper or preparing your manuscripts? And uh, where to submit your manuscript? What kind of process your paper go through? Your paper goes through, you know, after the just like after you press the su submit button, and also why my paper is rejected for what reason? My best research, the best research that I have done in my life so far, is being rejected by the journal. Why? You would like to find out the reason. Yep. And also you would like to know if there's any second chance after the rejection. So hopefully, my talk will uh, answer all these questions in the list. So um, to Nature Publishing Group, we believe that a good paper doesn't really uh, doesn't start at the moment you write a paper. It starts long before that. So these are the three steps that we believe will lead to a, a great paper. So the first step is the thoughtful research. So it's the kind of research you know you start. You need to know why. Just like Peter said, you need to ask yourself why do you want to do that research, and what interests you. What, why people find it uh, difficult to do and what kind of um, methodology you would like to use in order to come up with a better result or a more advanced technology. Yeah. So this is the first thing that you need to ask yourself. Uh, thoughtful research before you actually start doing a research. And also, um, don't just follow what your supervisor asks you to do. So think about the research yourself. Do some literature uh, review before you're doing that. Yeah. Take the advice, uh, take the suggestion from your uh, supervisor as uh, advice, yeah, and make your own decision. And the second step to a great paper is thorough preparation. So it's not just about writing, it's about how you make your experiments work, how you make your simulation work. So you need to think properly, plan properly before you do it, before you carry out. So this is uh, also before the process of writing a, uh, a paper. And then when you have the result, when you have uh, something to share to people, you need to know how to come up with a logical explanation about the results that you obtain. So it's not just about, I'm excited, you know, I have very good results and I want to tell people. No, you need to come up with a very nice, organized way to tell people how you get it, why you think it works. Yeah. So these are the three steps. And before you write a paper, and even better, before you start doing your research, you should think about these questions. So the first one is, why does the topic interest you? So as I said before, you need to ask yourself why the topic interests you. What was, a, what was thought, known, done before this work? So you need to do some you know, research before you uh, survey or background research before you start the, uh, your, the, your topic. So you need to know what has, done, has been done before, what has been published before um, by other groups, before you make a decision to start doing the research. And what are the key findings of your work? After you have your results, you need to tell people what actually is the key finding. Not everything. Of course, you have many things you th to you are new, but you can't just share everything to people. You need to, point, uh, you need to focus on one point and figure out why it is important. So the key finding is important here to share with people. And what, what is the main message for your readers? 
again, focus on one message, not try to branch out to too many things. Yeah. And definitely not to branch out any new ideas in the conclusion. Yes. And uh, how does new data change the thinking or support current approach or open new avenues of research? So, of course, it's important that you have got your result. But I think to the community, it's more important that you know, they can actually apply your ideas or apply your results to what they are doing. So you need to tell people what kind of uh, you know, future research your results will lead to. So it's, this, is a, this is an important question for you to think about. So as I say, don't think about this question just before you write your paper, but think about it before you start doing your research. So um, what makes a great paper? So these are the ingredients to us, the editors in Nature Publishing Group, think are the, the, the good ingredients that can make your paper a great paper. So of course, the first thing is high degree of novelty or innovation. So if the, whatever you do is very new, very novel, very innovative, this is the best, I mean, the, the, the best, the, the, the thing that journals want to get from you. And uh, the second uh, ingredient is, if your paper is interesting to a broad range of readers. So if your, in, your research uh, or results are, are only interesting to a certain community, community or to a specialized community, specialist, it may not be something that a journal wants. So if it is interesting to a broad knowledge of uh, people, that would be better for your uh, paper to get a better chance to be published. And uh, the other three things that we are uh, looking for is a significant step forward, breakthrough in performance, and a high impact in the field. So these are related to your results, the, the kind of immediate impact your results will give to the community. And uh, of course, important advance in scientific understanding that provides new direction for research, as I said before, is important that it will lead to something better in the future. And uh, to be a great paper, also data that can persuasively support conclusion is also important. So you can't just say, this is great, and uh, the result is going to advance the um, field very much, but without giving the very convincing data to support your claim. So the data that can support conclusion is very important. Um, one thing that I would like to emphasize here is, of course, all these seven ingredients look a little bit impossible, right, in one paper. So you need to be very novel, you need to be very, uh, with break, uh, breakthrough, you need to be with uh, new uh, results that can advance uh, uh, certain technology. So it's a little bit impossible to get these seven ingredients in one paper. But I think to most of the journals, I would say, uh, definitely to all the nature journals, we are not looking for everything in this list. What we are looking for is, Either your paper is uh, reporting conceptual advance or technological advance. So it can be um, a new concept that hasn't been uh, demonstrated experimentally. So it can be a new concept. Or it can be a concept that has already been reported, but it is the first time it is experimentally carried out. So that is what we say technological advance. And another type of uh, example of technical, technological advance is for example, you can advance, improve uh, technology by many orders of, uh, by giving um, uh, many orders of uh, magnitude in terms of its resolution, in terms of its speed, or yeah, this kind of technological performance can also be considered as a, a type of technological advance. Yeah. So we are not looking for both advances, but only one, conceptual advance or technological advance in this case. And the next thing that you need to make sure that your paper has is, it is interesting to everybody, not just your specialized community, and uh, plus with uh, convincing uh, data to support your conclusion. That these three ingredients will lead to a publication in uh, journals that you would like to submit to. And uh, so to prepare your paper to, uh, for the journal, um, I think uh, Peter emphasizes, uh, emphasized many times just now in his talk. So you need to get your points across. So you basically, we are salesmen, yes. You need to sell your work. You need to pitch, you know, to get your work be interested by the readers, by, by the editors, by the reviewers, then the readers. So you need to make sure that you, your points get across to the readers, like in a very clear way, a very uh, successful way. So the hint is, write for both the beginners and the experts. So you could be the experts in your field. 
right? You, so you know a lot about what you're trying to report in the paper. But thinking about it, maybe other readers of the journal or maybe even the editors, they are beginners of the topic of your research. So you need to tell them in a very organized way why the, uh, to present your work in a systematic way. Yeah, so it's very important here. So maybe the kind of uh, spirits of a salesman will come out, you know, uh, subconsciously. Yes, yeah. So, so uh, again, this is the title. So I think it's, uh, this is uh, just like uh, Peter said, it's important to have a good title in the work in, in, uh, of your paper because that is the first thing that people glance through in the table of contents. So imagine a journal publishes maybe 100 papers a month. So are you going to go through the 100 titles or maybe 100 papers a week? I don't know. So are you going to go through all these titles? You know, like think carefully whether you want to read or no? No, you will just browse through. So in order to get the attention of the reader, it's important that you have a very nice title. So what is nice title here? It's a clear and attractive title. Yep. And not too general, but not too vague either. Okay? Not too general or vague, and not too long, but short and precise. So something that you know, people look at it, and then they will say, mm, this is a nice paper. It has a very potential um, advance here. I would like to read more. So people will go into your, uh, the link and to read, to, to read the abstract of your paper. So that, the title is the first thing that you need to make sure that it's interesting. Yeah. So and normally we do not want to see any numbers. So any numbers or any acronyms, abbreviations or punctuation. So again, you are the expert, but others can be beginners. So when you say FBG or SPM, people may not know what you're talking about. So don't use this kind of uh, abbreviation acronyms in the title. So I have a very good uh, example here that I would like to share. So instead of record electro-optic coefficients of 170 picometer per volt and V part of one volt at 1.55 micrometer in hybrid chronoscopy, so even to read it is quite a uh, suffer, right? So I would suggest not to use this kind of long title. So we, uh, Nature Photonics, actually suggested to the authors why not using hybrid polymer sojal waveguide modulators with exceptionally large electro-optic coefficients. So people will say, wow, ex exceptionally large EO coefficients. So let me go into the paper to find out how large. Yeah. So this is uh, just an example yeah, to show you what is good title for your paper. And uh, so the second thing that people look at is the summary or the introductory paragraph of your paper. So it's very easy to lose your reader you know, by writing a thesis instead of an intro. So you try to feed too much of information in the very short introduction. So because you're excited, right, to tell people about your work, so you forget, you know, you, you need to do it in a very, you know, systematic way. So you try to write a thesis instead of a paper. So very soon you will lose your reader in this case. And or you try to include too many unrelated branches of thought. So, as I said in the beginning, you need to focus on one main message and try to try, uh, tell the readers about the, the key findings of your work instead of telling them everything about your work. Yeah. So, these are the things that we, not encourage, uh, we don't encourage you to do. Uh, again, the hint here is to introduce the field, clearing a path for the reader to follow. Yeah, so it's very important. So, uh, for all the papers that uh, you are writing, you're submitting to, Normally, you need an abstract, and you need to have a very nice abstract to attract the attention. Yeah, but normally abstract only allows you to have 150 words. So you need to make sure that you feed people with enough, just enough information to get their interest. So um, okay, from the editor point of view, we think a good abstract should start with two to three sentences on the basic introduction to the film. So very basic introduction, just to tell people what your work is about in general. Followed by a brief account of the background and motivation of your work. So here is the point that you start to talk a little bit more into your own research topic. And also, what have been done before? What have been done before? What have been uh, achieved before? And what are the open uh, questions in, uh, in, your, in that research topic? What are the problems? Why people are trying to do the research in this uh, direction? So tell people in a uh, the second part of this abstract, followed by one sentence of statements of the main conclusions, starting with, here we show, here we demonstrate. If you are the sole author, just say, I demonstrate. 
here I show, here I demonstrate. So it's very immediately you're telling people what my work is about. So people will always read, here we are demonstrating something. So they know this is your work. This is what about the paper is about. Yeah. So very clear sentence here to say. And uh, at the end of the abstract, try to give uh, two to three sentences putting the main findings into general context. So that is the part that you try to link your work with other fields, with other, uh, other researchers. So to, 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 make them think, to make them think that your research results are going to be interesting to their research and applicable to their research. So that is the last part of the abstract that you should try to do. So it's quite easy and I'm sure you can also do it in two minutes of uh, introduction for during your poster session. So basically, the general part of your research, followed by what are the open questions, what have been done before, what are you trying to do, and what have you shown, what have you done, followed by why you th uh, the implications of your work to the other, uh, other researchers. And uh, in the main text, normally that is the part that you start to involve the materials that you use, the methods that you use, principles, mechanisms, results with your displays, and the discussion. So these are the main part of your um, uh, paper. And uh, for the discussion, we just like uh, Peter said, it's important that uh, it's important that you compare your work uh, with the previous result. So to show the advances that you report, otherwise people may not know. So what? So you achieve this uh, great uh, result. So what is it? What does it mean? So that is the discussion. Is the part that you try to tell people why you think your work is better than the previous work. Yeah. And uh, you have to give some theoretical or practical implications in this uh, discussion uh, part. Conclusion regarding the significance of your work. Yeah, why you think it is important. Yep. And also, you, if they, there are some limitations, you can also disclose here in the discussion part. But uh, I'm not asking you to disclose in two, three paragraphs about the limitations of your work, because then the reviewers will start to say, your work is quite limited. Maybe you should go back to do more work before a resubmission. So that is not a wise way to do. So just give some limitation to say that these are the potential limitations in our current work, which we are trying to do in the future work. You know? So at that part, you can try to propose some future work that's in your plan. So again, don't tell people in two, three paragraphs about the future work that you are trying to do. You will interest your reviewers to tell you, I'm interested in this, uh, this part of the future work. Can you do more and submit later and have, uh, in another submission? So not try to uh, give too much of future work, but just a certain, uh, to some certain extent, yeah. And uh, so you need to write with the readers in mind. Yeah, this is what we are trying to say many times here. Focus on a single main message uh, questions and then the work on it and try to tell people how you successfully manage to overcome the problem. And uh, plan the contents and organization with an outline, especially the flow of the reasoning. So you, you should write it down before you write the paper, not when you are writing the paper. And uh, I think I've been asked by readers before, like uh, if you are not an English native speaker, uh, is it impossible for you to publish a paper in a journal? Um, I would say that if you read journals, you will find that the majority of the authors are not uh, non-English uh, uh, native speakers. So that means it, oh, it's always possible, of course. Uh, what we are asking people to, to do here is to use very simple, direct, and concise wording. We are not asking you to write a poem or a, or a story or prosa, you know. We're asking you to write a technical paper. So what you need to do just to be clear about what you are trying to present. So use very simple English to describe your work. Don't try to go to the word you now type your word and then go to this thesaurus, trying to find a, you know, equal meaning of the beautiful English to, to be written in your paper. So this is not what we want. We just want something very simple here. Yeah. And um, check that all parts are connected with a persuasive reasoning, appropriate structure, linkage and context yeah, before uh, when you're writing your paper. So these are some tips that we'd like to share with you. Um, always write your paper in active voice. Okay, of course, at some parts, you, you have to use passive voice. But when you are trying to emphasize something, you know, to talk about what you are doing, what you have done, use active voice. So, for example, we did rather than it was done. We demonstrate rather than it is demonstrated. Because, you know, maybe you're sending a very uh, uh, ambiguous message to the people. Actually, you are the one that did the experiments or somebody else. 
So, but if you say we did, so it's obviously you did it, right? Yeah. So it's important that you use active voice instead of passive voice and state the present work in present tense, state already published work in past tense. So that is going to be clear to people, you know, what is uh, this uh, paper is trying to report here, the current work, yeah. And be concise, uh, be concise, limited space, uh, you know, there's always limited space for a paper, for example, four pages in optics letters, 1,500 words for a letter in Nature Photonics, uh, 3,000 words uh, an article in Nature Photonics. So there is limited space for a paper. So you need to make sure that what is important, you need to choose what is important to be in the main part of the paper and what is not important. For the not so important uh, content, there's always a way for you to, to, to uh, report. So in Nature Journals, there's a method session that you can actually move all the characterization or materials that you use in your experiment to a separate session as methods. Yeah. So that you know, when people are not so interested in knowing what kind of methods you are uh, using or what kind of characterization machine you are using, they just continue reading the paper without being uh, distracted. And for people who are interested to follow, to follow up your experiment, they will go to the method to read more about how you do the experiments, what kind of materials you are using. So try to be selective, what you want to be in the main uh, part of the paper, what to be in the method yeah, session. And also express a appropriate level of confidence about your work. So it's important that when you're very confident about your work, say it out loud. Okay, don't be too polite, you know. I think this is possible, you know, because of our results that we obtained. It shows potentially that it can possibly, you know, uh, solve the problem of this topic. So don't try to be too polite. Just say it out loud. We are confident that this is going to solve the problem of the these decades or something like that. Yeah, so be confident. So these, these are some levels of uh, confidence you can use. So from impossible to implausible to unlikely, plausible, possible, probable, likely to certain. So, so just use the right word to express your level of confidence in your paper. Yeah. And uh, do not extend your conclusion beyond those that are directly supported by your results. So, you know, just say what you can deduce, you know, what you can actually digest from your results. Don't say something that is impossible to achieve because you just want to sell your paper. So that, that is not a good thing to do. And uh, can you put your work into context? Explain the importance uh, of your findings in relation to previous paper. So comparison is the way. Compare your work and say what kind of advance you have achieved in your work. And uh, give potential impact and future work. Yep, it's important as well. Make sure that you reference relevant uh, previous literature. So don't try to miss any just because you think your work will be discounted, it will be, um, the novelty of your work will be compromised. Because it's very easy you know, for the reviewers, for the editors to pick up when you're trying to hide something, you know, hide references. Yeah, especially reviewers, when they know that you're not citing their work, so then, uh, you know, it's unlikely your paper will be published. You know, they will think that you're trying to hide something from the community. Yeah. So th these are the things to avoid. Big titles, don't hype. Don't try to write a thesis or fairy tale. Um, don't try to give claims that are without sufficient evidence. Uh, poor referencing is not good. Poor quality figures uh, either are not good for a paper. So this, so now you try to write a paper, so now you go to the point that you need to submit a paper. So uh, as you can see now, you know, there are so many optics uh, journals in the community, it's very hard for you to choose where to go, where to submit, you know, you have a, a piece of good work. So you need to think properly because there are many journals here and uh, all the editorial, you know, the editorial scope of this journal overlap. Yeah, because we are all optics journals. So you need to choose carefully. You need to go to the website to read what kind of papers that they want. What kind of papers uh, these uh, journals have published before, before you submit a paper to this journal. So I would say that choosing your, um, the choice of the journal depends on the editorial scope of the journal and your target audience. So you need to see what actually you are trying to report here. Is it more on a material-based report or more optics-based report? or more nanotechnology-based reports. So you need to ask yourself, you know, what kind of uh, reports I'm trying to submit here and what kind of, uh, what type of audience I want to target on. So if it is material scientist, of course, then you should go to maybe nature materials, advanced materials, 
or maybe advanced uh, functional materials journals. So or, or um, optics express material optics optical materials express. Yeah. So you need to figure out your target audience before you submit the work. And I would say that if you think your work is with the broad impact, you know, a very novel work, uh, novel work that can uh, create a big impact to the community, I would always su suggest you to go to, you know, big journal. Big journal that you think it will be read by many people. Okay, of course, not to a journal that uh, will not be read by your community. So you need to make a balanced uh, thinking process here. So if you think it is a very good with a broadest and uh, deepest impact, you can always try nature or try science, you know, big journals if you want. Uh, because, you know, even if you fail to get your paper published, that in those journals, you can always go down, you know, go to other nature research journals, go to Optica, go to Optics Letters. Yeah, so because I think the reason is very simple here. If Nature Photonics uh, receive a paper, a very good paper, optics paper, and it's with the deepest and broadest uh, impact to the community, we will not recommend you, maybe you should go to Nature. No, no. We will just say, I'm going to publish a paper in Nature Photonics. So it's your choice. You choose to be in Nature Photonics. So we will not suggest you to go to Nature or Science. We will just keep your paper. We will publish your paper. So you have to make the decision where to submit. Yeah. Choose properly before you submit. So um, let me allow me to introduce a little bit about Nature and Nature Journals uh, in this presentation. So Nature uh, is a flagship journal of Nature Publishing Group. It's, uh, it was first published on the 4th of November 1869. We have a long history of publication, uh, publishing uh, publication here. It is now the world's most highly cited uh, multidisciplinary science journal with a very, uh, the latest impact factor of 42.351. And uh, yeah, so this is the, the main journal of uh, Nature Publishing Group. And uh, in order to cope with the limited space in the journal and also you know, keep on publishing very good papers from the community, Nature Publishing Group uh, decided to launch more journals you know, in, the topical, uh, in, in uh, different topics. So in the Biological Sciences Division, we have uh, other you know, bio journals, for example, Nature Genetics, Nature Cell Biology, Nature Methods, Nature Neuroscience, Medicine, Chemical Biology, Biotechnology. So these nine journals belong to the Biological Sciences Division of uh, Nature Publishing Group. And recently, uh, the group started to launch uh, different journals in the Physical Sciences uh, Division. So I'm sure these are not, uh, um, this should be familiar to, uh, to you here. So we have Nature Materials, we have Nature Physics, Nature Nanotechnology, Nature Photonics, Nature Geoscience, Nature Chemistry, and uh, Nature Climate Change. So these are all the journals in the physical sciences journals. And um, so this is the nature photonics. So the editorial scope of the journal is very wide. Basically, we publish all kinds of optics and photonics research. Anything, you know, anything that uh, is do with uh, lights and uh, optics and photonics, we are interested. So you will see that we would like to see papers about lasers, many, uh, imaging, display, spectroscopy, uh, optical physics, quantum optics, nonlinear optics, plasmonics. OE uh, devices, also X-ray, terahertz optics, biophotonics, PV, uh, optical communication. So all kinds of optics and photonics uh, research, we are interested. Yeah. And uh, very recently, you will also find that uh, there are more than just nature research journals in the community. So we have nature communication and scientific reports. And uh, these two journals are open access journals. Uh, just recently, Nature Communication turned to be an open access journal. So totally open access journals. So these two journals are very similar. They are uh, an online only open access peer review journal reporting all kinds of uh, research in natural sciences. And I think the difference is uh, Nature Communication publishes papers with uh, important advances of significance to specialists within the field. And for scientific reports, there is no threshold of perceived importance. You know, your paper doesn't need to be very important, but as long as you are uh, reporting valid results, you know, valid results, something that you did, something that you uh, obtained, and they are supported by um, uh, uh, convincing data, that can be published in scientific reports. And of course, to be an open access, you need to charge uh, article processing uh, uh, charge. So the authors need to pay uh, a fee, APC fee. So 3,700 euros for nature communication. And then uh, for scientific reports, it's 1,165 euros. So th th this is, this is the, a big difference between the open access journal and the nature research journals and nature. Yeah. 
So you will see that uh, there are so many jitters, even in the nature uh, family. So it's, of course, it's going to be very confusing to you. But uh, I would say that, uh, you know, even if you submit to the wrong journal in nature, it is not always the end of the story because you can always choose to use this uh, manuscript transfer system that we provide to the authors when you get a rejection from one nature journal. So in that, uh, in that system, it's very easy. Everything that you want to transfer from one journal to the next journal, you just need to click a button, just hit transfer. So everything will be transferred to the next journal, including your cover letter, your paper, your figures, your supplementary information, and including review reports if you choose to transfer. So the review reports, if your paper was uh, submitted uh, to review before by uh, uh, the other journal, the first journal, you can always uh, make a decision whether you want to transfer those reports to the next journal or not. It's up to you. You are the authors. You make a choice. Of course, good, good review reports, you will try to some transfer. But bad review reports, I would suggest you to keep them to yourself, you know, not to show to anybody. Yes. So you have the optional uh, option to do here. Yeah. So we do this because all the nature research journals are editorial independent. We don't talk to each other. You know, editors don't talk to each other about what kind of submission, or what kind of manuscript we receive. So we don't talk about this thing. Yeah, because we just can't. We, have, we are different journals, editorial independent. Yeah. So one rejection, uh, a rejection from one journal doesn't mean a rejection from the other. So nature photonics doesn't like it. Maybe nature materials loves it. So you can always transfer, yeah. But you have to do the transfer in a very careful way. You can't just, like Peter said, you can't just transfer from nature and then you go around the nature research journals, you know, from nature materials to nature climate change. And then you go down to nature communication and then scientific reports. So this is not a wise way to do your transfer. You need to stop at some point, you know. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> it's a little bit hard to sell your work, yeah. And also, you can, uh, any time of the, uh, the process, you can choose to submit your paper as a fresh manuscript. So for example, you send to Nature, and then uh, rejected by Nature, you transfer to Nature Photonics, and then uh, you think maybe one trans after one transfer, you can try another transfer. So you go to Nature Materials. It's okay, it's still acceptable. But I think for the subsequent thing to do, I would suggest you not to transfer anymore. You should choose to submit as a fresh manuscript. As I say, editors in the, in the family, we do not commute, uh, we do not com communicate. So we do not know about the history of your submission unless you choose to disclose to us by transferring a manuscript. So you authors make the choice, transfer or not transfer, optional re uh, review reports to transfer or not, yeah. So as I say, authors can still choose to submit a fresh manuscript, yeah. And uh, we always, uh, we, we, we do not uh, discourage transfer uh, among journals. So I, I can't say that we encourage, but if you think your paper can be uh, interesting to another journal, you should try to transfer, yeah. So uh, we have these uh, new services here I would like to share. It's a very recent, very, they are very recent, very new. So we have this kind of service that we call inter-journal consultation before transfer. So for example, if your paper is uh, not so good not to be accepted by one journal, uh, as author, during your submission, you can always say, I would like to have consultation uh, during transfer process so that the editors can talk before they send the um, decision letter to you, the rejection letter to you. Okay, so if you choose to have this uh, consultation happen during the process, the editors will be able to talk about your editors. Of course, after one editor makes the rejection decision, then they'll open up the discussion to the next editor of the, the other journal to, to, to see if the next journal is interested in your paper or not. Yeah. So you can choose to have this inter-journal consultation before transfer or not to have it. Yeah. And another new service that we introduced this year is a double-blind review process. So you can always choose not to have your name disclosed to the reviewers because always you don't know who review a paper, right? So you think it's not fair that they know about you. So at this, uh, in this, starting from this year, you can always choose not to, to tell the reviewers about your name. Yeah, you can just tick the box, say, I don't want them to know my name. And don't write your name in the manuscript. Don't write anything in the supplement, uh, supplementary information. Uh, yeah, so that you know, everything is uh, blind, you know, it's uh, not uh, disclosed to the reviewers. Yeah. 
So uh, um, again, the cover letter is very important. So it is a letter, a separate file only readable to the editors. It's very important here. You may not think that it is important because you think it is just a formality. You know, with a letterhead, with a something, dear editor, this is my submission. Yours sincerely, your name. This is not true. Cover letter is very important here, and uh, I would encourage the authors to write cover letter on each submission. Yeah. And that is the place that you restate the main message and significance of a paper, your paper, and to explain in clear and simple terms why you think the, the, your finding is uh, are important and what is their potential impact. So that is the place that you try to attract, try to convince the editors why you think your paper, your work is interesting. Yeah. And also in a cover letter, you can suggest referees. Tell us who you think are the best person to review your paper for us. So suggest some referees because you know your suggestions are always valued. We you know we will get some suggested referees from very often. I think we get suggested referees from you to review your paper. Of course, not all of them because then it could be a little bit uh, weird, right? Maybe they're all your families and friends. So that is something that we try to avoid. And of course, before we get them, we will check a little bit about the background and also if there's any um, you know relationship between uh, you and the uh, review potential referees. Yeah, before we assign them to be the referees. And also, the cover letter is the place that you can suggest who to be excluded from uh, reviewing your paper. And it's very important here because maybe who knows you have competitors. You have someone that will try their best to prevent the publication of your work. So tell us in the cover letter who shouldn't review this paper for us. Yeah, why? Because conflicts of interest, because uh, they, they were in your group, but then they left with anger or something like that. You fought before. So just tell us, you know, in, in, uh, with honesty. Yeah, we always not take, we always try not to take anybody in the excluded list because there's no point that we get somebody that we think will be biased. It's a waste of time, yeah. So this is a very good example to tell you what is a bad cover letter. So it's too brief, there's no explanation why the paper is important, there's no suggested reference or, or exclusions, there's no, uh, there are no details of format or the length. So basically, you're not writing any cover letter if this is the cover letter that you're writing, yeah. So this is a very good example. So it, the, the cover letter explains clearly the paper is in letter format. It explains and emphasizes the important points of the work of this paper. And it also gives a list of referees. So this is what we say, a very good cover letter. Yeah. And uh, so when you're, you submit a paper to the uh, journal, so what will happen to them? So it's important you, you know about the process so that you know how you can react when you get something from the journal. So what happened to your paper? So the first thing is, uh, as editor, we assess the, your, the likely impact and appeal of the paper to the entire optics community. We need to know, you know, why your paper is important. Of course, for other journals, not based on optics, we will review as well whether your paper is interesting to their community. Yeah. So we read relevant uh, references. We look at previous publication to see if there's any previous work. We especially check the previous works done by you. So, you know, some authors, they publish, already publish some works in another journal or in some other journals before they group everything and they submit to us. So it's very important that we check what the authors have published before. So you need to reference properly in your paper. And uh, we aim to reject papers that are not in line with the scope of the journal within seven to 10 days. And I guess this is also what other journals are trying to do as well, try to give you a very rapid uh, answer during this uh, screening process so that it's not going to be a waste of time. You can go to other journals. And uh, we also discuss with other journal uh, editors in the team before we make a decision. When we, we have doubts, we always send it out for review. Yeah, when we are arguing about whether your paper is good or not, we always pay for the benefit of doubt by sending it out for review. And uh, for the Nature Publishing Group uh, editors, we only use the referee reports to help guide decision making. So we don't just listen to the referees. We don't count votes. We don't uh, just follow what they say. We put ourselves you know, as one of them to think whether the paper is something that is going to be interesting to the community before we make a decision. So the re referee reports are only a guidance, a guidance to us. So this is the cycle. So when uh, there's a paper coming, uh, coming out, uh, it will be assessed by the editors. And then we try to decline the papers within seven to 10 days time. 
And if we like the paper, we, we send it out for review. We always give about two weeks to the referees to come back to us with uh, review reports. And then we will make a decision again whether to decline the paper or to accept the paper. Or maybe some revision, further revision is needed. We will ask you to do before a resubmission and then back to the editors for reassessment before an acceptance, uh, the acceptance of your paper. So for the Nature Publishing Group, all the editors are independent and also uh, we make fast decisions because we are independent. We are not working for any university or we are not tied to any organi organization or any institute. So there is no editorial board, there is no scientific affiliation. Decisions are, decisions are independent and quicker because we are, oh, are full-time editors in this case and uh, referees provide guidance about technical accuracy and significance but ultimately the judgment about which paper best suitable suit uh, the re readership is made by the editors not the referees so these are the possible decision um, yeah the same to what peter said before accept or revision is needed or reject but you know with an option that uh, you can come back to us after further work and, uh, and the last thing is the reject outright. That means you know, we don't want your paper, we don't want to see you again, so you can go to some other journals. Yeah. So these are the common reasons for rejection. Of course you want to know why your paper is rejected. You know, this is the best work you have done before. So uh, the first uh, common reason is failure to meet editorial criteria for a discipline. Yeah. So, so when you choose journals, it's very important that you choose the right journal to go to. Not like, I think you say something like, it's, it's something totally different from, for optics letters. Yeah, but somehow you receive it. So, of course, this kind of manuscript will be rejected outright, without discussion, without assessment. Yeah. And the second uh, common reason is, the second common reason is, incremental advance over published uh, literature. So, maybe you or somebody else have already reported uh, similar work, maybe similar results. So, it's not really like a big advance anymore in your paper. So... Then it will be a rejection. Lack of new insights. So it's interesting, you know, your work. But, you know, it's, it's like straightforward. People know what, this will happen. So it's not really something very new. So normally it will lead to a rejection as well. And if it is only interesting to specialists in a subfield, then, you know, the community is too small for us to publish your work. Yeah. And of course, when there are technical concerns raised by the referees, we always, you know, will not. We always will not uh, accept your paper. We want you to do more revision to address the concerns uh, raised by the referees. Or maybe your results are a little bit too preliminary, requiring more study. So we need something more solid from you. So we will reject now for the moment at this stage, but then you, will, you are welcome to come back with a revised manuscript. So these are the common reasons for rejection. So of course, then you will come to the point like, no, I don't agree with the, I don't agree with the editor. I want to appeal. You are welcome to appeal when you have a rejection. So if you have something to tell, something to, act, to say to the editors, to the reviewers, you are always encouraged to come back with an appeal. So write and explain why you believe we, as editors and referees, have overlooked or misunderstood your point. Yeah, tell us in a scientific way. Don't just, you know, be angry and try to, 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 to sound frustra frustrated or all these things. So give scientific reasons about why we should look at the paper again. So normally, your revised manuscript will go back to the same referees, so we will need a very strong case, you know, if you want, you know, to replace the referee, to replace the previous referees with new referees. So we need a very strong case. You need to tell us why you think none of the previous reviewers or one of the previous reviewers shouldn't be re-review your paper for us. So you need to explain to the uh, editors. And of course, during this stage, during the process, your paper must not be submitted to uh, other journals for publication because that will be considered as uh, duplication. Yeah. It is likely that some time will elapse before editors can respond because it's a complicated case, it's an appeal, it's not a fresh manuscript, not a fresh submission. So you are encouraged to appeal, yeah. but uh, not this way, not using this kind of language in your appeal. So you can't just tell us that the referees are unfair but without giving us the reason why you think they're unfair. So you need to, you know, back up, back support the, this statement with more explanation. And you can't always tell me, oh, tell us, oh, 
I think I know this referee. The referee number one is uh, someone that I met before. This is Professor blah, blah, blah. And uh, he doesn't like our work. He visited my lab before. He says something negative. I know him because he likes to use the word yeah, 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 or something. So don't try to, don't try to guess. Don't try to guess in this case. Yeah, it doesn't help. And don't try to give us this kind of uh, like uh, endorsement. Sir John Pendry said this is the best work in, uh, uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this research field so far that he has seen before. So, you know, this kind of endorsement doesn't help in the appeal. S so save your time not to say anything. And uh, cosmetic rewriting. So basically, you're not doing anything much. You're just, uh, you know, moving the paragraphs around and try to play around with your, your, your language a little bit. So it doesn't really help. And uh, of course, don't tell us how famous you are, how many invited talks you have been gi uh, uh, invited to give, and how many journal papers you have reviewed, you have published. So you are important, so your work should be important. So this is not the case, yeah. And uh, you can't really compare. So something like your paper is better than the horrible paper X that we published before. So if that could be published, mine should be published now. So it doesn't really help because, you know, Things happen at a different time, so we judge them at a different time. Yeah. So these are the things to do. Plan your paper when you plan your research. Uh, yeah, when you plan your research. Consider the readers as beginners and, exper and uh, as experts as well. Carefully choose the journal and follow the guidelines. Advice from the experienced authors always helps. So you know, ask them what they, they en encounter, what kind of difficulties uh, they encountered before. So plan your submission carefully. Uh, try to avoid salami slicing. So salami slicing, what I mean here is don't try to publish your A result in one journal, B result in another journal, C result in another journal. And then when you have your D result, you try to group A, B, C, D together and send to one journal. Especially to the high impact journals, your paper will not, have, uh, will, will not uh, likely to be accepted in this case. So plan your submission carefully. What journals you want to go and how you should strategize your submission process here. So that is the end of my talk. Thank you. So questions? By reading uh, Nature for Dunning's articles, it's impact in the work and the results uh, that are published are achieved in a uh, few years period. And usually we uh, the authors also cite the, their own uh, works in the same paper mm. f from the different journals. And how do you uh, how do you uh, decide if it's uh, original material or and how much of the work has to be original or something? Yeah, of course, uh, sometimes it's quite difficult to tell. But you know, when we assess the paper, we assess the paper very careful, uh, carefully. We don't just read your current submission. We also go back to your previous, uh, previous uh, publication to read through them, yeah, everything. And then we compare. So based on the advan uh, advances that we are looking for, conceptual advance or technological advance, we will decide whether it is enough a case to be sent out for review. So it's quite subjective. I mean, it's quite hard for me to describe to you now because it's a case by case basis and topic by topic basis. So, but we do very thorough assessment when we uh, receive a new manuscript and uh, when, uh, especially when we know you have a previous publication in the same topic as well. Yeah. Mm. But how usual is the situation that uh, some parts of the paper is already published? Is it often? Mm, we try to avoid that. But if, uh, as I say, if it is a theoretical work, if the work that you published before was theoretical work, and now you, found a, you, you find a way to experimentally carry out. So we will try to judge. So this is a theory. Uh, uh, it, it is a theory that, uh, it was a theory that you reported before. But now you manage to carry, uh, carry out the experiment. So if it is something that is very difficult to carry out, and after some time, still nobody can carry out, but you manage to do it, so that is something that we call uh, uh, sufficient advance to warranty uh, out for review uh, uh, decision. Yeah. Mm. Another question about conferences. Do you accept the uh, results already published in conference? Yeah, yeah. I was uh, waiting for this question when they asked. Yes. So uh, we do not take conference papers as a uh, previous publication because we think conference papers are not uh, going through rigorous peer review process. So if you have a conference paper 
in the already uh, already happened conference or uh, upcoming conference it's fine we do not discount your novelty or your or advance because of that conference paper but what we ask from the authors uh, is not to talk to the media not to talk to the media about your work when you have a submission uh, with us so I, I know that for example in Clio there's a media you know they always uh, before the Clio conference they always interview the authors you know with uh, interesting papers they always interview the authors about their work so in that case if you have a submission with uh, Nature Photonics you should decline the interview because that is media is important here this is uh, is, is violating the embargo policy of the journal yeah but you are free to publish any conference papers yeah, when you have a submission. Mm. Sorry. Sorry. Maybe I should add on, maybe archive as well. Maybe you're also interested to know if you have a paper in this kind of uh, archive service, uh, online archive service. So again, uh, Nature Photonics doesn't mind if you have a paper archive in this kind of uh, online portal. It's fine. But we always ask you to respect our policy as well. There's one policy. So you can always... Uh, upload the first submission, the first version of your manuscript onto the website, your website or this kind of online archive website, archival website. So the first version, not the subsequent uh, revised version after review process. No, not, not at all. Yeah, so only the first version. And if your paper is published by the journal, you can always upload the final version your, the final version, but not with this kind of gallery proof, nice nature photonics type, you know, this kind of label and all this, not this version, but the final version that you submit to us in the uh, online archival website. Yeah. And uh, six months after the publication. Yeah. We have a question over there. Yes. Uh, if you get, to, let's say, two revisions, and one of them is, says, basically says that the paper is uh, good, suitable for publication, uh, and another one does that the paper is horrible, and so on. Uh, how do you decide to go for the third uh, uh, Yeah, it happens very often, you know, because, uh, you know, people are different, right? So, you know, everybody can have different views. So we have this kind of very extreme review reports before. One very positive about it, one somehow just very negative about, about it. But to start with, we always ask for three reviewers to review a paper for us. So unless, you know, we are, we are not able to get the third referee in time, you know, to... to, to, to to get back to the authors, we will go with two re uh, review reports. But in this uh, special, uh, very difficult uh, situation, we will look at these two reports, and then we will see how, when the referee uh, doesn't recommend the publication, why they doesn't, uh, they, why the referee doesn't recommend. We need to see the reason. They, he can't just say it's horrible paper. Full stop. No, it's not enough. That means he doesn't really review the paper. You know, he just doesn't like the paper. So we need to see the reason and the kind of uh, explanation behind his recommendation. And also, we need to know why if, if, the, um, the negative, uh, if the negative comment is a very subjective uh, comment or it is a very objective comment. If it is just his personal view, I don't think this technology is going to fly. I, I don't think, I don't believe it. So it's not really uh, convincing here, you know, for us to trust him that the paper is not good, the work is not good. So we will not, we will not put weight on this kind of review reports. Yeah, and also for the positive reports, we want to get explanation as well, why he likes the paper. He can't just say, I love it because it's very nice. Yeah, because I know this group of people, they always do good work. So this must be a very good paper. No, this is not a very good reason for us to, to go with publication. So we want very good technical reasons to support the recommendation of publishing the paper. Yeah, and sometimes when we can't really make you know, decision, we will call in a third referee to help us to read the two reports and then to give us uh, comments on these two referees to see if the negative reviewer is too harsh, too picky, or not reasonable. And uh, yeah, tell us uh, the, the, his view. And also, he can also review the paper for us at the same time. So not just to review, but also to look at the comments by the other referees. So we will involve more reviewers if we need to. Yeah, in this case. I also have, uh, I also have seven questions about that. Yeah. Uh, sometimes uh, some people just uh, try some kind of, uh, and they ask for more experiments. And uh, they keep uh, 
the paper uh, not published for longer and uh, during the time they publish their own paper mm -hmm. in another journal. Mm. Uh, how do you try to promote that? Yeah, I, I think uh, before it happens, we never get to know, right? Because we just don't know what is going on behind the, 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 the screen, so behind the paper. So we do not know whether what kind of game the reviewer is playing until the paper is published, right? Until his own paper is published. So um, as editors, we always pay a lot of attention to everything, not just the manuscript, but also the review reports. So if we sense that the reviewer is giving this kind of uh, you know, uh, very, very, very harsh or very, very demanding, demand, demanding uh, 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 suggestion on experiments or on f future work to do, we will stop it. We will just say to the reviewers, maybe this is uh, something a, a little bit out of the scope of the current work. So we will just tell the uh, reviewer that we will ask the author not to do it. Yeah. Or, the, uh, the authors can always come back to us to tell us we do not think this is a, a feasible giving the given at a given time scale. So can we choose not to do it because it is out of the scope? It is uh, not something that can be easily done. We think that the current report, current finding, findings are very important and should be published now. And the future work will be done in the future. So if the authors come to us, we will weigh in their, uh, their explanation before we get back to the reviewers and the authors whether you know, they should do the experiments or not. Yeah. And also, we will keep an eye on the uh, reviewers as well to this kind of behavior. If we find that someone is doing this kind of uh, um, intentional delay in the reviewing process, we will put a remark down on this uh, referee and then we will not use the referee anymore in the future. Yeah. Uh, published before. So let's say someone published an article that was uh, poorly cited or not interested uh, for anyone. So if that author will uh, 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 submit the manuscript to the journal as, uh, again, will that play any role that the, his previous articles are not well cited? Yes, I mean, important? it is published. So, you know, whether it is highly cited or not highly cited, the fact that it is already, it was already published. So we will take that as a prior art of the current submission. So if we find that uh, the previous paper, uh, uh, the previous paper has uh, already reported what they are trying to report now, we will not consider the current uh, submission. Yeah, regardless of whether it was, you know, that paper was, is highly cited or not highly cited. So you have to be careful when you choose journals to submit. I have a very similar question. You said that uh, it's a bad idea to compare uh, manuscripts or papers in the response to reviewers or referees. Uh, like this one is worth and you should publish. Mm -hmm. But is it a good strategy uh, to include a statement, for example, in the cover letter that, for example, that paper was set, cited like 1,000 times in three years and my paper is kind of uh, of a similar topic and uh, it's, it's mm. really you know hot <laughs> hot area and, and uh, you should publish it ah, is it okay. a good strategy um, of course psychologically it may affect the editors mm -hmm. you know because you are giving them uh, in information that they may not know it's like wow that means a lot of people are looking at this uh, the direction right so maybe i should also you know jump on the wagon the journal also needs to jump on the wagon to publish something similar. So psychologically, it may help. But I think we need to, you to give more explanation behind the citation. So it's not just about the numbers, it's about why the work is important. It's going to give a big impact in the future. Yeah, it's not just about citation. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, thank you for a very nice uh, overview. Uh, I like mm -hmm. it a lot. One of the uh, points you, you mentioned as uh, a novelty in, in, uh, in Age of Tonics mm. is your uh, blind review. Mm. And uh, if I understood correctly, you are offering this as an option, but you're not enforcing it. No. So what do you expect will come from that? Would you expect that, uh, let's say, um, I'm from Oxford, Cambridge. I would mm. like to disclose I'm from Oxford, <laughs> Cambridge. Um, mm. I'm from a small university, for example, the Technical University of Denmark. Uh, I would like to disclose that. Yeah. Not, uh, I mean, I would like to blind that. 
why are you not doing that for everybody so everybody will get the same treatment and you can't use mm -hmm. your brand yeah um, to to guarantee to as you said well they're from that group they are I'm going to be positive. I'm going to find all the positives. Mm -hmm. No, I think uh, before we launched this service uh, uh, in all the nature journals, we did uh, have a pilot run, you know, a, a test yeah. uh, experiment. So I think Nature Geoscience, Nature Nano, they started with this kind of double blind experiments before. And uh, they found that the results, from the result, it show, uh, they show that some people would like to, some people would not want to. So, and also some of them, they complain about not having one, uh, not having the choice. Some people just uh, do not really mind. So, I mean, to be fair, we just say, okay, it's up to you. You can choose, optional. So it's up to you to, to, to not to disclose yourself or no. Yeah, and, but I think from the results, yeah, it doesn't look like uh, it is, uh, many people choose this uh, option. Yeah, so far, people just say, no problem to be, to be known. That is actually, yeah. that is actually also, uh, let's say, my impression. Mm. So, so, let's say, what do you expect to gain from the current practice mm. uh, where it's optional? How do you see that improve the papers? That's my first. Second. Yeah. How is it? I think for the moment we don't have um, much to tell. Okay. Yeah, we just started maybe just one or two months ago. Right. Yeah. So, do, do you think? At some point, you will say we'll do blind review. Period. Who knows? Yes, we are always open. We are always open for changes. Yes. But is that? Do you do you see that coming or? I think personally, I don't think it's going to happen because uh, at the moment it's not really like a very popular option for the authors. So, yeah. But we were still um, uh, having it. We will still have it as an optional, as a choice to the authors. But we will not, you know, like try to. And force it, yeah. From what I see, what the current. What reaction you get from the reviewers? Sorry. What reaction you get from the reviewers when they get this uh, blind paper without the authors? Um, I think from the two re uh, journals that they did the experiment with, uh, I think it's okay. They were fine. With it. I mean, if the authors mm -hmm. do not want to disclose their names, the reviewers are also fine with it. Yeah. And for Nature Photonics, again, it's uh, too soon to tell. So so far, really, it's very rare to see this uh, option thick in the submission. Maybe so far I've seen this year, since we started, in my, the, the manuscript that I received, maybe one, only one, yeah. So it's not really like a big case. Mm. More questions? Yeah. Uh, you look for, uh, if the work could have been started before in other languages, let's say in French or in Lithuania or Chinese. Sorry, do we, do we take them as? Mm. Yeah, that is difficult, right? I mean, if we don't understand a language, it's hard for us to catch. Yeah, but so far we, yeah, we do not. Yeah, we do not take them into account. Yeah. For example, there are papers in Chinese. Yeah, I know. I understand Chinese. Yeah, I, I read Chinese, <laughs> but I, I don't read all of them, right? So, and when I when I go to Google search or Scopus or this kind of web website, I'm not typing in the Chinese uh, <laughs> keywords, right? So, yeah, we do not do this kind of uh, policing on the uh, other uh, foreign language, foreign languages. Yeah, so English mainly. Mm. Any other questions? We still have some time. I will ask a question. Yeah. As an author, I really love uh, writing supplementary material uh, mm. next to my paper. But yeah. as a reader, I just hate it. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah. Actually, as an editor as well, so long. Yeah. Uh, but I know that many journals, many yeah. journals have policies uh, that try to avoid using supplementary material for like additional discussion, uh, to include discussion into yeah. supplementary materials. But Let's, let's admit many authors kind of cross this line or balance around it and they really put some really important information mm. and, and more discussion to supplementary material. And it, for, for a reader, it becomes quite hard to uh, read a paper which is full of references to supporting tables, supporting figures. From an editorial point of view, would you like to fight this uh, situation like uh, somehow to 
reduce the amount of supplementary materials? Yeah, the scope of, of yeah, we don't have a limit in the uh, supplementary information, so it's really up to the authors, you know, to to put, you know, what kind of uh, information that they want in the any kind of information that they want in the supplementary uh, information file, but. We, we read supplementary information and the reviewers as well, they read the supplementary information. So uh, from there, sometimes we can suggest to the authors and say something like, maybe you shouldn't put all this uh, you know, uh, extra additional information in the supplementary file. So we do suggest to the authors not to put too much. Yeah, we read them. I know it's a little bit of a pain as well for the authors, but actually for the editors as well, we need to read through them. <laughs> so, so we just ask you to put a very important uh, no, related information, information that is related to the main finding of your work in the supplementary information. Yeah, and normally that is the session that's uh, more for when you have vi uh, video clips, audio clips, audio, maybe not, video clips, you know, to go with your submission because they can't be written, they can't be published in the, on the paper, right? So we encourage you to put them in the supplementary information, but not like, you know, Something too excessive, yeah. Mm. So, you have one what about releasing raw data after it's published for public access? And yeah, we actually have another online journal we call Scientific Data. So, you are encouraged to put those raw, uh, raw data in Scientific Data. It's a publication as well. Yeah, so it's a new uh, product from uh, Nature Publishing Group. So you can have a look if you want to, yeah. So, you know, I, I'm sure you have a long list of uh, things to, to tell, right, in that uh, raw, raw data. So why not consider this part? It's quite, um, it's quite often that people, after publishing with us, with the journals, they go to scientific data to give more data to, to the uh, community. Mm. Yeah. So, no more questions. Uh, let's thank Rachel once again. Thank you, thank you, thank you.